Okay. Hi, Greg. Hi, Shaggy. Hello. Hi. Do you, would you like to turn on your cameras and say hi? We're just going to get started in a minute. Uh, we're just starting up the live stream, but we're pin, pinning our view for now. I'm Doug. Oh, this is Doug from Fort Space. Mm, you can't see me. <laughs> Camera looks good. Yep. And I can give you an overhead view here so you can see. That's kind of what it looks like in here. And Alora's at the main table. Hi, Greg. Hello. Can you see me? Yeah. Great. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Should we get started? Laura, are you are we good? I'm going to pass it over to you, Laura. After, I'm just going to do a quick intro here. Sure. And I just want to welcome everyone back in Cordy University's Force Space, and thank you for joining us for the next part of today's series. This one we're titling Practice in Creative Practice and the Classroom. Uh, and just to let you know, we are streaming to YouTube live from Force Space. We are also located in unceded Indigenous lands in Chijage, Montreal. Running this as a live stream Zoom meeting. So those of you joining us that way via Zoom, just uh, we welcome and encourage your comments and questions in the chat. Everyone in the space, as you probably know by now, if you would like to participate, we'll run a microphone over to you so that we can all hear. But with that, it is my pleasure to pass it over to artist, writer, researcher, Laura Crawford. Laura, thanks for coming in. Thank you, and thank you for that introduction. Um, welcome everyone to the practice panel. As you heard, my name is Laura Crawford. I am a, an MA student in the Department of Art Education at Concordia, and I'm also a keywords um, teacher. I'm a TL for the keywords team. So today it is my pleasure to serve as chair for this panel on creative practice in the classroom, and we're joined by panelists over Zoom, which will be a nice, dialogue uh, here. I'm in the fourth space and you are in sort of this third space online. Um, so once introduced, our panelists will each present and afterwards we'll open up for a Q&A. Uh, first, we have Assistant Professor of Art and Design at the University of Southern Indiana, Greg Blair. Blair's scholarly research and artwork intertwine various forms of writing, publishing, zines, sculpture, photography, sound art, earth art, installation, and video. And the title of his talk today is Writing Like an Artist, Finding Your Author Voice. Thank you for joining us, Greg. Thank you. Um, I do have a little, um, some visuals to go along with my presentation today. So is, am I able to share my screen? Yes, you can, Greg, go ahead. Awesome, perfect. Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you for attending this presentation today. Firstly, I'd like to thank Molly, Claire, and Sandra for putting together this event. I'm very grateful to be a part of it. I'm looking forward to this afternoon. Uh, the paper that I'm going to be presenting to you today is titled, Writing Like an Artist, Finding Your Author Voice. As an educator that has been teaching a variety of art history, art studio, art theory, philosophy, and gender studies courses for nearly two decades, I have gone through ever-changing permutations of assorted writing projects and assignments. One of my main goals along the way has always been to help students find their individual voices as writers. There is an odd phenomenon that I have noticed over the years in which art students can be quite confident and assertive with their voices as artists, but when it comes to writing, their self-assurance often seems to dwindle. By utilizing some different techniques to teach writing than those that were used to teach me, my hope is that my hope is to help students gain confidence, poise, and find their own unique writer's voice. To achieve this, I have developed a variety of strategies, techniques, and approaches to writing projects that I want to share with you in this presentation. Many of the writing assignments that I utilize focus on practice-based or experiential learning strategies which emphasizes the thoughts, interpretations, 
and articulations of the individual student rather than relying on a hefty amount of historical research. Some educators that I have encountered have accused me of pandering to the students or of falling victim to just another form of grade inflation. Many of these educators seem to advocate for an unchanged platonic ideal of how to teach art history and writing. After all, what worked 15 or 25 years ago was good enough for most of us, wasn't it? Do we really need something different? I, I believe there will always uh, have a there will always be a place for knowing the rules of a proper manual of style, but I also want to make a case that teaching practices need to evolve and adapt over time, so that we are effectively helping students find their own writing identities, so they can become the next generation of artists, historians, critics, poets, or philosophers. One of the first steps that I take in opening students up to the idea of writing about art of writing about art is to lessen the intimidation and apprehension that they feel towards writing by making it relatable. One method to make writing connected to what they already know is to get them to approach writing using similar ideation processes that they are comfortable with in their artistic practices. By connecting writing to art making, I encourage the translation of skills from what they do as artists and designers to how they can develop their writing. This can include things like sketching ideas, looking at other solutions to a similar problem, not always using your first idea, peer sharing and user testing, maybe or perhaps maybe even creating a mock-up. I also ask them to think about how the higher level learning skills that they have already developed through observing, interpreting, analyzing, critiquing, and evaluating artworks, uh, which are likely used in nearly all of their studio art course critiques, how can those be applied to the construction of a written assertion or argument? I also remind them that artists are wonderful creators of visual metaphors and analogies. As an illustration of this, I often show them some pieces from a series of visual idioms that I created several years ago. The series included visual representations of common idioms such as walking on eggshells, um, cut the mustard, and cross your fingers. By sharing these images, I try to help them understand that the same creativity that students often utilize to develop visual metaphors and symbols in their art making can also be applied to the construction of metaphors or the cre creative use of language in their own writing. Another more recent and still developing challenge to get students to become smitten with writing and find their own unique writer's voice is the advent of AI-assisted writing. In order to better understand why students are increasingly drawn to the use of AI for their writing needs, even though the potential risk may be very high, such as failing a project or maybe even an entire course, I decided to find some answers from my students by doing something perhaps uh, somewhat or unorthodox. I simply just straight up asked them, why do you use a AI instead of writing something yourself? Here are some of the responses that I received. I use chat GPT because of the novelty of it. It is something new that I just wanted to try out. It feels rebellious. I used it because I'm straight up lazy. I didn't want to use it, but I had poor time management that week and under a time crunch, I had no other option. I used it because I have ADHD. And finally, I use AI because I don't have any passion for writing. We had a productive discussion about these responses, but then I also offered a thought that I uh, offered a thought I had about a possible underlying reason to many of the answers that the students gave. Maybe students sometimes use AI instead of doing their own writing because they feel their opinion isn't valued. Many of the students slowly nodded their heads, and the farther we explored this idea, the more they told me that sometimes they feel like their opinions about art or art history don't really matter to someone that is already an expert in their field. And the expert they're talking about is the professor of the class. 
One student told me that she, uh, one student told me that sometimes she feels like her individual insights about com concepts being discussed in class aren't really important. From these types of dialogues with students, I have evolved my writing projects to become more student-centered and narrative in nature into something I call critical responses. As I introduce each of these critical responses, I typically begin with an emphasis on attentiveness and care for the distinctive perspective of each individual student. I don't care what a robot thinks about these things we are discussing, I tell my students, but I do deeply care what each of you thinks about them. By situating the thoughts of each student as central to the writing project, my hope is that they feel personally invested into crafting a meaning, meaningful response to the prompt questions that I ask. This is how my critical response writing assignments work. We do some type of reading, we have a class discussion about the reading, and then they each write their own critical response to a series of prompt questions relevant to the reading. For example, when we read Walter Benjamin's essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, the questions that I ask him in the critical response paper include things like this. In his essay, Benjamin discusses the loss of aura in mechanically reproduced artwork. What do you think aura is? How do you think aura has been lost in mechanical reproduction? By focusing on and emphasizing the response of each student, these writing prompts drive primarily from two types, from two of the types of traditional English composition. The first of these is narration, in which the mode of writing explores the subject through the author's description of their experience. The other type of composition that these writing projects lean towards is argumentation. Similar to a persuasive essay, I asked the student writer to examine two or more positions on an issue and through a logical exploration of each, demonstrate why one position is more favorable than the other. Concentrating more on these two types of composition rather than description or exposition, which certainly have their uses and productive outcomes. This is my method of attempting to steer clear of information regurgitation and rote memorization to get a better sense of the level of comprehension for each student. Is this a foolproof method? Does it always work? Uh, it certainly does not, but sometimes it does. And it really is just one of the strategies that I utilize in my overall goal of helping my mostly Gen Z students find their writer's voice. As a teacher of writing, I still discuss and demonstrate with my students what proper Chicago manual styling looks like or what the proper, proper nomenclature is for different styles. I spend time doing a live demonstration of how to do some basic formatting and insertions such as creating an endnote or footnote, which students are often surprised to find out is not the same thing as a footer. I have recently spent more time and care in doing these activities because not long ago, I discovered that at least at my institution, these are not taught as part of our standard English composition courses. I was really not as angered and outraged about this as some of my more traditional colleagues were. And in fact, I found it to be useful information to understand why students weren't expertly throwing out footnotes with the same, a same ease as handing out flyers to a garage sale. But all of these details about how I approach the writing process really all circle back to my main goals as a teacher of writing to, as a teacher of writing for art and design students which is for them to find their own writing style and personality, to not fear writing as if it were an ominous creature lurking in the shadows, and to figure out a way to compose that will allow them to write about their own artwork and designs, something they will undoubtedly benefit from as they move forward in their careers. Learning to write well is not always a day at the beach, but it is something that has tremendous value and can be very rewarding. As an entry point into the lovely and gratifying world of writing, I really challenge my developing student writers to find their own distinctive writing style, tone, and personality. I don't want them to write in a way that they think academic writing should be. I want them to be creative, and I want them to be radical with their writing. I want them to be bold, 
to be bold and exceptional and maybe even break some rules if the overall out outcome of doing so leads to something more prodigious. One of the means that I use to start to get started on this kind of a path is through the first assigned readings of the semester. With virtually no context provided, I asked them to read some short pieces that I believe are witty, pithy, and don't necessarily have anything to do with art, but serve as tremendous examples of interesting writing. Some of these kinds of writings might include something um, similar to Emma Rathbone's essay, What to Do If You See a Bear, which suggests that if you ever encounter a panda bear, you should know that they are really, what they are really thinking is that they'd like to make a haystack out of your hopes and dreams and then put a match to it. Or perhaps I might have them read Mike Lacker's essay titled, I'm Comic Sans, Asshole, written as a forceful first person retort to all of that shade that's been thrown towards Vincent Conner's low typographic creation for Microsoft. When I ask students why they think that I got them to read something like these things, especially because they have nothing to nothing directly to do with art or art history, they are often befuddled or maybe even slightly annoyed, as uh, was the case with one student who stopped me in the hallway before we had even had a chance for a glass to class discussion to ask me, why exactly did you make me read this? I explained to them that these are models of how I want them to write with their, with their own distinctive individuality in a way that is thought provoking, engaging, intriguing, and possibly even humorous. Do these examples of a looser free form, more narrative style of writing actually help the students to find their writing voice? It is a difficult question to quantify, but I do have a topical example that I can share written by one of my students named Madison in response to questions that I asked of the students after reading Clement's, Clement Greenberg's well-known 1939 essay, Avant-Garde and Kitsch. In her response, Madison wrote, and this is quote, according to Greenberg, being able to stay educated and have the energy to even care about high culture and high art, let alone be able to understand and appreciate it, is a sort of luxury in a sense that a lot of the working class people like me don't get to indulge in. They got other shit to worry about. While I don't necessarily encourage the use of expletives in student writing, I feel as though this is an, is a, an example that demonstrates Madison taking ownership of her own writing and providing an honest, genuine, and authentic answer. It also reveals a good level of comprehension of Greenberg's sort of plebeian and patrician cultural divide, as well as many, as well as maybe some uh, demonstrable sense of shared experience and empathy with Greenberg's peasant working class. Each of the um, strategies and techniques that I've described here today are all implement, implemented as a means to get students excited about writing and to begin the journey of finding their own writing voice. But they are also part of my larger attempts to transform and adapt my pedag pedag uh, pedagogical methods to the needs and realities of who my current students are. This ongoing metamorphosis focuses on student engagement, active experiential learning, accessibility for multiple learning styles, and varied, mo varied modes of evaluation. I truly believe that these efforts can't be dismissed as pandering to students and instead should be carried out with great care as necessar necessary work that aids students in becoming better writers, increases comprehension and, and retention, and help, helps them make connection between what other artists and designers have created or written and what they are doing or want to do as the next generation of creative thinkers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, our next panelist joining us today is a film and performance art practitioner, researcher, and educator, Shagageg Yasemi. Yasemi is a PhD candidate in critical studies in improvisation at the University of Guelph. And the title of her talk today is Creating Live Conversations with Sources Through a Fragmented Approach. 
Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. I am very happy to be here today, and thank you for having me. Um, so I, uh, I had a last minute change of plans because there was some sort of misunderstanding about the duration of this presentation. I will try my best to cover uh, the main um, ideas of my draft, but I won't be able to do the whole uh, thing. Uh, so in this uh, presentation, I am going to uh, discuss, first of all, uh, writing um, uh, with two approaches, like academic writing versus creative writing, and then uh, how we can combine the two. Uh, then I will provide an example and briefly speak about the referencing part as well. Uh, so I, my background is in theater and film. So before my PhD, I was always in uh, art creation sort of environments. When I started my PhD, I started to have some sort of issues with my writing. One of my favorite example was in a class that every time I was handing an assignment in the form of uh, a video, a clip, a photo or whatever, the professor was asking uh, for me to submit an explanation. And it was like, uh, what should I explain? <laughs> and she was like, please explain how your material is connected to uh, this assignment. So after a while, I realized that it doesn't work because I'm doing lots of job for this course. So I started to hand her text. And again, she was asking me to submit explanation. Uh, so I uh, took three years of intensive writing sessions at the Library of University of Guelph uh, just to improve my writing skills in an academic setting. And the good thing is that I gained a very valuable experience that is uh, great for me. And also I share it with the students and because lots of them might have the same confusion. For example, in the film courses, I have lots of examples that the students uh, tell me that, but it's a film. I don't like to have the same in structure that I used to have. I like to free flow into the subject. And then I, I will share this experience with them. Uh, I think that uh, academic writing and creative writing are not two separated worlds. The only issue is that art is very new in universities and academia comparing to other like science fields and other stuff. And um, in lots of places, we are still following the same pathway as, for example, science. And um, I think it's very important to benefit from both creative areas and approach and also academic approach, because then we can broaden our perspective. And then also we can broaden the scope of the audiences, readers or audiences, if it's a film or other stuff. So I will provide an example to say how we can combine the two. Uh, imagine if we wanted to write about uh, a subject like census. Um, so I always tell my students that the main thing would be to ask yourself good questions. So what is my subject? How can I make myself interested in this subject? Because sometimes we are not that much interested in the subject we need to write about. Uh, and what would be inspiring for me to start to think about the subject? Um, do I have a creative approach to it? Can I find a creative approach to it? And then uh, the question of the structure would come afterwards. So let's start with the creative part. A few years ago, after I was graduating from Concordia, uh, I went back to Montreal for a week uh, to discuss my next steps with my former supervisor and other professors. And uh, I rented a room, which I uh, didn't check beforehand. It was awful. There was a rat in that room and it was very dirty. <laughs> so, 
but I have also lots of exciting experience about that 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 journey because every morning I was waking up with the smell of bagels. I wasn't sure if I'm smelling the bagel or if I'm eating the smell. Can I tell you how that works? I think you know how it works. So anyway, I was rushing downstairs. There was one of those uh, wonderful bakeries of Montreal, bagel bakers in Montreal downstairs. I was uh, standing in the line and waiting for my turn. And it was always very early in the morning, like 6.30 or something. Then the visions of the sacks of flowers, those big knives that they were cutting the sacks, uh, the texture of the flower that I could have seen from uh, further away, the um, seeds they were pouring on the bagels, the voices. One, uh, Montreal is one of the most wonderful places in the world that you can hear lots of languages in. So uh, the voices, the different accents, the noises of the bakery, and then it was that magical moment that it was my turn. And someone would have asked me, what kind of bagel do you like to have uh, this morning? And then I was rushing upstairs, grabbing a cup of coffee to enjoy that bagel. So what did I do? I told the story in a creative way. I combined the senses in that story because I spoke about um visions like the sacks of flowers, the seed. I spoke about the smell of the bagel. I spoke about the uh, texture of the flower or seeds. Uh, I spoke about the, um, the, like all of the senses that we can think of and I combined them. But is it enough for a title or paper about senses? No, but we already took one of the important steps. We I, as a writer, I am interested in this subject because I have a personal story about it. I have a way of saying that, telling that story. So the next step would be for me to decide about my structure. Do I like to start with keywords, introduction, statements, then the separated paragraphs, each for one uh, statement and the discussion of that statement, conclusion, and all of those steps that you already know of. Uh, I would say that we don't need to necessarily if for some reason I decided to dive right into my creative story, I just need some sort of hint for, for my readers to know that I know that I am breaking this rule. So I am aware that I'm doing that, but I have a good reason. Please bear with me. I'm here, <laughs> I, I will discuss the senses afterwards. But how am I going to discuss the senses? How do I provide my references? Um, one of the things I can think of is those paintings of Peter Bruegel. He has those paintings of the bakeries or bakers with those cute small breads on the trays and people in the line and um, Actually, I recently see one of them in the museums and it was, it was amazing. I could have smelled my favorite bread while I was seeing that painting. Um, what I'm saying is that we can, through combining the emotion in a creative way, evoke, uh, evoke those senses in our readers. We can ask them to accompany us in taking this journey of their, their memories of combination of senses. For example, uh, in a bakery. For example, with sense of, with, with the smell of uh, their favorite bread or whatever. Another creative example would be the film, Amélie Poulain. There, there is a scene in that film when she puts her fingers into a sacks of brain and while she's doing that, you can somehow feel the grains uh, on, on your fingers. Like it's a, it's a very enjoying scene in that film. It's a very short one, but it's a very enjoying one. So while I was speaking about those sacks of flowers, the texture of flower, I could reference to that film and that scene. And this, this, this would be my... Uh, academic statement, how we can evoke senses, combination of senses in our audiences, in our reader through a creative process. And uh, I will go back to 
where I started, I think we can combine creative writing and academic writing. Uh, we just need to learn the rules, own them, and then if necessary, break them or bend them uh, and find our ways. So yeah, that, that, that was my, my presentation and thank you again. Thank you so much to our speakers today. Uh, we'll open up for questions from the audience and from our Zoom audience as well. Um, so if you have any questions, raise your hand. I'll come over to you. Maybe, oh, are there some questions? Uh, no, just seeing if anyone in the space, uh, you yes. can just raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Those of you on Zoom, uh, you can place your questions in the chat and we will read them out loud. Yeah, Molly Claire. Um, thank you both for your presentations. I, I noticed that one of the things that both of your talks had in common um, is the use of source material and like modeling writing or modeling engagement with the senses for your students. And I wonder if you could, and so you're using really different source material. You know, Greg, you mentioned these different texts that have really strong and clear and unique voice. Um, and then you mentioned more recently that looking at examples of film, for example, um, film that engages with the senses and getting students to think about that as a model. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to modeling writing with a voice um, and, and how do you model, I don't want to say good writing, <laughs> but how do you model um, voiceful writing for your students and maybe what are some examples of, of readings or other cultural works um, beyond what you provided that you could maybe point us to for thinking about that? Please go on, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, I don't know if I have any sort of like non-writing examples that I can specifically think of off the top of my head. Um, you know, I mean, when I'm teaching art history, you know, I use examples of the things that we're trying to understand um, from from any source. Like, I, I, there's nothing really that's off limits for us. We t we look at stuff from pop culture all the time, stuff that they are going to more individually, I think, have find a connection with because it's, you know, it's things that they're um, looking at or, or uh, paying attention to on their own um, anyway. But um, I think for me, the biggest thing is uh, just encouraging experimentation and to be looking to towards places and other sources for um, inspiration in in finding their voice as writers. It doesn't necessarily have to come from kind of the traditional academic writing that we're used to. Um, you know, I th I think um, some of the non-writing stuff might help them think of how they can be voiceful. Um, I like your term, Molly Claire. A voiceful in their writing, um, and and I think maybe some of those alternative sources are going to be more um, effective for them than reading a Greenberg essay. Yeah, thank you for this question. I very much agree with your response, Greg. And I one of the things that I do in uh, my courses. Actually, this workshop, uh, that I, I, I had this presentation as a workshop in mind, and I always do this uh, this way, that I, I pause when I start to provide that example. In this case, it was a bakery, and ask people that, uh, right now, what kind of what kind of experience can you think of? And uh, that's amazing that how many different sources people can think of. Uh, in many cases, uh, painting is a rare example for them, but there are lots of examples from films uh, and there are lots of examples from stories. But I try to broaden the examples. Like I, I, will, I will have some sort of, for example, examples from poetry or painting or drawing, because I think uh, the vaster these, these areas are, uh, we can also um, evoke more 
creativity in in in, in the the discussion. So I, I I don't really think that there are specific, uh, for example, texts or even films or or uh, artistic areas. I think it's great if they the the participants, the students can free flow into this and think about whatever they can think of as their references. I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, we do have some extra time because our third presenter um, was uh, um, held up and isn't able to be with us. Do, would you like to give us one of your workshop prompts right now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I don't know if uh, if um, do do like to participate because that uh, those workshop uh, examples need some sort of participation. So, um, um, okay, uh, I already told you the story of the bakery. Um, where, while I was telling the story, and I already provided two examples of, of this, uh, the scene or painting, can you think of anything that you, uh, that make you think about your favorite bakery or bread or whatever? Uh, you can also think about for example, uh, your your childhood memories of how your mother was baking a cake. It doesn't need to be a specifically a bakery or a bread. So can you think of something that you, you'd like to share with this discussion? I could speak to that, that prompt. I'm immediately thinking of texture. I'm thinking of the texture of dough. Um, and maybe to riff off some of your, your talk and some of the themes that were coming up is this, this idea of the, the multi-sensorial textures of text, right? And so too, in your, in your talk, Greg, you're talking about the visual, visuality of metaphor as a real fact, right? How crossing your fingers can be seen as a photograph as well as a sentence on a page, right? So thinking about the texture of dough really reminds me of that that part and brings me uh, into my own experience, which I think is effective. But not to get too meta, I'll just give the example of dough and then return that back to you. That that's a great example. Actually, I you made me think about. Uh, one time that I was, as a student, presenting uh, something in one of my classrooms at Concordia, and uh, my professor thought about dough and the way her mother was making those with, I don't know the term in English, but do you know what I'm, like, when you need to oh, do this? Is it, Sorry? Is it Play-Doh you're describing, or is this an edible yeah. form of dough? Okay, Play-Doh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Plasticine, yeah. So, yeah, and uh, he started to speak about his experience of seeing her mother doing that. And then uh, he he was so emotional, he wasn't able to continue speaking about this, the experience. But what made, made that experience, I... I Actually, it was like four or five years ago. I wasn't even remembering that, but you made me think about that that experience. So what I'm saying is that it's a very shared space. So uh, you speak about though, I, I remember something from five years ago. Uh, someone else would think about a film, a painting or their own uh, personal experiences. And that's referencing, that's creative referencing. I, our only job would be to uh, make a good a structure for the whole thing and uh, turn it into an essay if we need to. Right, so there is that balancing act of the creative impulse within the structure of you know, academic conventions. And I think mm -hmm. this is something both of you are, are addressing in your talks today. And it was one of the questions that I had, um, which you, of course, spoke to great uh, clarity on in your presentations. But I wonder if you could give us some of these practical examples of how to frame that tension or how to frame that approach, the in-between, you know, the convention of of you must cite this way, or you must follow a paragraph structure with starting from your own voice 
as an author, starting from your own experience? How might you frame that to a classroom of students? Rick, would you please start, start this and then? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really great question. That's really sort of um, at the heart of the difficulty of this is, you know, we still have rules, we still have a structure, um, but how can we find as much wiggle room within that as possible so that each and every one of you in the room here is kind of exploring their own directions, you know, and finding their own voice. Um, what, uh, what I do a lot of times for my assignments is I will choose just one of those rules or one of the kind of conventions that they do need to learn about. And we do need to sort of, you know, want them to have a, a good level of understanding. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of make it so that that writing project is we're really only concerned with that one rule for this pro for this writing thing that we're doing now and all of the other rules can kind of um, get bent a little bit or maybe can kind of fade to the background and as long as they're doing you know kind of getting a uh, good practice on that one rule and that's really how i sort of uh, frame it to them you know the the you know the funnest thing in the world is not writing a bibliography but the only way to get better at doing it is to practice it a little bit so maybe that's what I'll do. I'm, you know, I'm just thinking about the current writing project that they're doing, um, where we really took some time to look at what is the proctor, proper formatting for a bibliography and how do you write a bibliography and, and practice doing some of it in class together. And that's really the only thing I'm concerned with, with this writing project. If they mess up any of the other rules, or I, I don't really care at this juncture, um, but if they can get their bibliography down um, whatever they do for the rest of the writing project is kind of wide open. Mm -hmm. I I am not sure if I am trying to um, asking the students to write within the structure of academic setting because I am not sure if that's the proper setting, like the conventional one, that is the proper setting for a creative area. Sometimes it really doesn't work. For example, I was writing my thesis um, and I, I had lots of difficulty because every time I was asked to follow these rules uh, of, for example, okay, uh, um, just imagine I always like to start with a, a, a verse of a poem. And <laughs> I had this very interesting question that, are these your keywords? <laughs> and I was like, no, <laughs> this is not my keywords. <laughs> so um, what I'm saying is that I, after a very long time of struggling with all of these things, and now I can understand why it was difficult for other people to understand what I was trying to do, because there wasn't that much of explanation, as they would say, that why I'm doing this. But right now, I learned how to play with these rules, and I don't really continue to uh, working within the structure. I think, uh, and I always try to ask the students the same thing, that learn the rules on them and then if necessary, break them. So I, I think if someone finds their own way of um, 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 structuring things, it's okay, why not? The only thing that matters is that um, how should I convince my reader that I know what I'm doing? So please bear with me. Uh, I'm not saying that I don't have like research questions or statements or all of these things, but I have them in my own way because I am a filmmaker. My thesis has two films as well. I wasn't uh, writing a report. I was writing a very fragmented text about how this whole art creation process made sense to me and how I want to make it a work for, for my readers. So I don't know if I responded to that, to your question, but that's, that's my way. <laughs> it's a great response. And I also love the idea of a poem as a list of keywords for a journal article. 
Um, and also the idea of bending the rules. Is there a question? Okay, uh, yes, is it, are we looking at wrapping up time? Okay, yeah, so the idea of bending the rules, knowing them, but knowing how to lay them bare as well and to call them into question. Um, I'm curious now about pulling out ideas around the word practice. Um, we've heard the word come up in several different ways. We have practice as a verb to be practicing, but then also as uh, an imperative or an instruction, right? So practice this, practice uh, the bibliography form. Um, and it's also a noun, right? You both are creative practitioners. Um, and so I'm curious about how you think about and relate to the word practice, both in your creative practice and then your teaching practice and how, that fold, how they fold together. I can let you start this time. No, please, you are the start. <laughs> <clears throat> um, that's a great question. You know, I'm sort of trying to think of, think of it on the spot here, because um, that is such a, a great word with so many different kind of meanings. Um, you know, that are a part of the, the art world and the discussions that we have, but, um, yeah, now you actually have me thinking about maybe how, um, significant and important that word, word is because, you know, you think of like a teaching practice or artistic practice is, um, inclusive, um, and, you know, it's wrapped up with so many different kinds of things. And um, it can be thought of as, as something more holistic. I don't know. I'm just thinking of that word. Like maybe what I like about it is that it, um, you can be, can be at the meta level of, a, of, you know, an artistic practice, but it also can um, be describing something, you know, some, sort of like banal minutia, like practicing writing a bibliography, um, but that um, maybe it's like a, like a small representation of the whole at the same time, that the whole and the the singular are are part of that all together because even the the small practice, you know, the you know, sort of uh, wrote, mechanical um, repetition of something um you know that's still that's still one of those things that makes up the large practice um so I don't know maybe maybe I you know I'm I'm like thinking out loud right now off the top of my head but um I'm just thinking maybe you know since you brought it up I'm wondering if this could be a important thing to um, emphasize to students about how the small micro, you know, is, you know, the singular makes up the collective and kind of the relationship between those two. You don't, you don't have a meta practice without the particular practice. And those two are, you know, in this constant relationship with one another. Okay, that's enough of my rambling. <laughs> No, that was a great response. I really liked it. I think about practicing uh, first as a filmmaker. So when you start to um, taking photos or making films, you will start with the, with playing with the camera. So uh, your your it's a very good chance that be, in between your first photos, there are brilliant ones. Uh, accidentally, mostly, and there are lots of uh, photos that are not that good. Uh, mostly is, is, is the case. And then after a while, you get much better at framing, and then you there is an era of perfect framing. So everything is a, in a perfect place. And then the next step would be when you are having a chaotic, lots of chaotic frames, but those are the good ones, I would say, not the perfect ones. So it's the same thing with practicing writing. I even ask uh, the students for one session that don't 
provide any text, just bring a clip that they would write with their camera. So uh, try your camera and try to write with it. And then in the next session, I will ask them to do the same thing with their pen. Because nowadays we are using lots of, you know, smartphones, recording, stuff like that, uh, ordinary sort of recording of everyday life with our smartphones because it's very easy. So it's, it seems like people are much more comfortable with working with the um, with the smartphones than the pens or the keyboard. So that, that would be one of the practices that I can think of. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience here. Hello, you both. Thank you for all of your thoughts so far. Um, a couple of things really stuck with me from both of your presentations, but um, I wanted to start with this idea of kind of finding a, a point of entry into writing and reading texts uh, from experience or through experience. Um, and then I was thinking about your kind of uh, gray group material metaphors and you're talking about the relationship between or bridging that gap between students art practices and their writing practices and that uh some kind of there might be some kind of actual material relationship between those things um but i'm wondering for both of you uh in terms of being teachers and writing uh and teaching to write um about if your these kinds of experimental or experiential approaches to to teaching writing, if this has actually helped students uh, in their creative making, either in film, photography, or sculptural practices, is there kind of a is there a feedback loop? Is there kind of any kind of reciprocal exchange that you've been able to recognize? <laughs> Thank you. Um, that is a really great question. I love that. Um, you know, just thinking more about, yeah, like how, how does it come all full circle? Um, and I really appreciate how you described, you know, that's kind of what I try to help my students understand is that, you know, words and writing is just another material, you know, so play with material the same way that they would in a studio, like they can go, you can play with it the same way you would with paint on a canvas or, you know, wood in the wood studio. Um, uh, and I th I'm hoping that once they sort of realize that, um, that that is a real nice entry point into finding their own voice, because then they're able to take the raw material and do whatever they would like with it. But um, the other part of your question is, is interesting as well. Yeah, that I mean, for me, that would be the ideal situation is that um, you know, what they're learning about writing and how they're learning about uh, writing goes beyond our art history classroom. And I have seen it with some students where they're either incorporating some kind of writing or uh, the inclusion of text into their studio practice, um, or they're taking the concepts that they've written about in an art history class and then use those as you know, the main concept or the driving force to creating a studio art project as well. And I've seen both of those things happen. And I'm, I mean, that's one of my, hopefully one of my end goals. I think that's the problem, you know, that I've seen uh, historically is often, at least with the students that I've worked with, or, you know, um, oftentimes they like to think of this, the studio where they're working and the, with their hands and making things is as mutually exclusive from the art history classroom. And those two don't really have to have anything to do with one another. And, um, you know, there's, they don't really have the thinking of how what's going on with writing or in the art history, how that can really sort of be like something really very valuable for them to take back to their studio practice. So hopefully, uh, you know, they're the, my hope is they take my class and they do more of that. Yeah, I very much agree with Greg. That's that's the hope. 
Uh, I think there are two different results after uh, people coming to my classes. Uh, I think uh, in most of the times uh, it's 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 good for their creative journey, but sometimes uh, the um, another part of this experience is that they turn into some sort of rebel students. <laughs> so <laughs> when they are writing in other courses, sometimes there are not that much of, um, you know, uh, th there are people who in universities that still think that writing should have a very studied in a structure. So like the professor that I provided the example of, uh, so why why are you doing this? This this doesn't work. You need to have your keywords first, your introduction next, and all of these things. So I think uh, it's at least in my experience, it was great in terms of the creative journey, but sometimes it was problematic in terms of uh, writing in other classes. I had a, a student recently that came to me and told me that uh, my professor told me that, why can't you stop fighting? <laughs> Please just start to write normally. I was asking her what was writing normally in his view, and I understand what is in his view. But I think it's part of our responsibility, you know, to fight this because this is when we need to combine the two and find the balance. So, yeah, I hope I responded to your question. That's great. Uh, thank you for that question and for your generative responses. Uh, we're at our time now, so I just want to thank you again for your presentations and for uh, what were such rich and practical methods for approaching the practice of creative composition in classrooms. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, thank you to Alora for uh, moderating that wonderful conversation. We're going to be closing up the live stream now, but we're coming back in less than 15 minutes for our next event um, with a workshop on play. So for those of you on Zoom, stay tuned. We will be back in less than 15. And for those of you in the space, feel free to grab a coffee and a snack. We'll be with you again shortly. Thank you, Excuse everyone. Me. Excuse me. Hi, I have a oh. question. Um, I'm supposed to present my paper. Are, do we have a time zone difference or something? Because it's at central time. And I believe we do, Stacey. You know what, Stacey? We're going to continue chatting with you offline. So just give us a second okay. and you're going to see in your chat that we'll pick up this conversation with you. Okay. Thank you, everyone.